All right, my friend, welcome to the next episode in the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel, where we take a fundamental approach to diet and exercise to give you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and author of the books that support these episodes. Links are down below for all of those, including Grand Style Calisthenics, Smart Body Weight Training, Micro Workouts and stuff. And speaking of my books... Finally, <laughs> I cut off my ass and fulfilled a request that I've gotten for many years, which is to make the books available in downloadable PDF form. Because uh, some people I know don't like going through Amazon or some people just prefer PDFs that you can read them on a tablet or something without having to go through the Kindle app and stuff. And they are now available uh, through the RDP merch store, which again, the link is down below so you can get the t-shirts and everything like that. But it is also where you can get the PDFs with, unfortunately, the exception of the PDF for smart body weight training, uh, largely because uh, the file is just too darn big. That book is just so big. It's so massive. Um, I actually clocked out the memory of the previous computer that I had that wrote the book. Um, because it's just, it's big. It's a massive book. There's over 500 images in it. So I'm trying to figure out some way to work around the technical limitations of being able to download and create that into a PDF. But right now I'm kind of stuck. But anyway, all the other books, PDFs now available in the merch store. So there we go. Oh, Michael's in the house. Drop weight daddy. Good afternoon, coach. So today's topic, what we're kicking things off is that of workout Nutrition. Uh, I get this question quite a bit from time to time. Usually it follows a lot of fads and trends that come up in our fitness culture where people start recommending, oh, you got to eat this way or that way around your workouts. And it's largely concerning around the idea of pre-workout nutrition, intra-workout nutrition, where you're eating something in between your workouts <clears throat> or excuse me, within your workouts. And of course, post-workout nutrition. And this is one of those topics that gets a lot of confusion around it. And it can be both simultaneously super critical important, and at the same time, a complete waste of money and energy on your part, because this is the way we want to look at this, right? It, a lot of this stems from this notion of what a workout is. So let me give you a story to illustrate how to pers put this into a proper perspective. So years ago, when I first started getting into exercise, and before I was really working out, but my workouts were just physical activities I just did, like uh, go to Taekwondo class. I had this one summer where I was really serious about my Taekwondo training. And before my Taekwondo classes, I would basically eat anything that wasn't nailed down. Because it was like, well, I got a big Taekwondo class coming up this afternoon or this morning. And at that time, within our fitness culture, was, everybody was talking about, you got to carb load, right? You got to carb up. So I'm eating cereals and I'm eating lots of fruit. And I was a big Fig Newton fan at the time. So I was eating a ton of those and just eat all of this food because it's like, I got to get ready for Taekwondo class. But at the same time, that summer, I had my first ever like real job. Uh, working for a car dealership, and it was a Volvo dealership, and my job was to wash the cars after they were serviced for the customer. And that was like, I didn't have a special hose or spray or anything. It was just a hose, bucket, and water. It was all done by hand, crouching down, getting underneath and stuff like that. Nine hours a day in the hot sun, washing cars by hand. But at the time, my whole approach to fitness, because like a lot of folks who get into fitness, like food is the enemy. Don't eat too much. Don't eat bad food. Don't like I was afraid of food. So I was really restricting my diet to a very large degree. So I had this crazy thing going on where daily I would eat basically as little as possible while doing nine hours of physical manual labor. So 45 hours a week, just sweating my sock off, working hard physically and trying to eat as little as possible. But because I would go to a Taekwondo class later that day before the class, I'd be like, I got to carve up and I'd got to eat all this food. Right. And all of these decisions were based off of the simple premise that I was going to do something called a workout. Right. So nine hours of physical work meant nothing but an hour of Taekwondo class, which if I was really honest and looking back on it, like after a warm up and sometimes my instructor would lecture us and stuff was probably only about. 35 minutes of real physical exercise and probably only about 10 minutes of that 
was anything where I was really getting my heart rate up. So realistically, it wasn't really that much physical activity, but because I was calling it a workout, I thought I got to eat a lot. I've got to take special considerations into uh, what I'm eating because I'm going to do this thing called a workout, but nine hours of physical hard uh, labor in the sun doesn't mean anything. Don't eat anything extra. When in reality, I had it backwards. I should have been eating more for the job I was doing and for that Taekwondo class, probably not even considered anything at all, uh, largely because it wasn't that necessary. And that's the biggest lesson that I want to impart with you today in today's lesson is that a lot of our perception around workout nutrition is based on this idea that there's this thing called a workout, that your body knows the difference between physical activity in a gym and physical activity done for any other reason, washing cars, helping a friend move their bowling ball collection or whatever. But fundamentally, your body doesn't know what a workout is. It doesn't understand physical demand that's separate from the physical demand of a workout. It just knows, what do you need me to do? And I'll adapt to accommodate that functional demand of whatever you're needing me to do. It doesn't know the difference between a workout and a job and a physically active hobby or anything. So with that in mind, what we wanna do is make sure that our nutritional considerations are based on that of general physical requirement, not requirements of a workout. Because ultimately a workout doesn't require anything special to require any nutritional changes. You know, that your, your body doesn't do anything different in a workout than it doesn't do through any other hard physical activity. So technically there's no need for any sort of nutritional consideration because you're doing this thing called a workout. It doesn't do anything special to your body. It just is another aspect of functional demand. <coughs> Excuse me. However, we do always want to keep in mind, are we feeding ourselves adequately to accommodate fuel and recover from all physiological activity we have in general? So with that in mind, we want to know that if we're doing something physical enough, yeah, there can be an increased calorie demand. So we should be eating more to maintain that demand. Yeah, we can have an increased demand in vitamins and nutrients and carbs and protein and fats and stuff. So we want to make sure we're eating enough to supply and feed that demand, regardless of what the actual demand is created by, whether it's a hard workout or because you commute an hour every way on a bicycle, it doesn't really matter. Second story is similar thing, right? I, when I went to Japan, senior year in college, I had that same mentality. So every day I had roughly about six hours of exercise, but in my mind, none of it counted because I didn't call it a workout. So I would ride my bike to school, typically as fast as I could, because that's the only way I ever ride my bikes. And it was about 40 minutes to get there and it was 40 minutes to get home. So roughly about an hour, 15 and change of basically hard riding, cardio, if you will. But in my mind, that didn't mean anything, right? Because it wasn't a workout, it was just riding to class. At the time, I was also involved in the local taiko drumming uh, school. And taiko drumming, if you're not familiar with it, is basically karate against a drum. You have sticks in your hands and you just beat the mother living hell out of that drum. It's very much like a martial art against a drum that's rhythmic, if you will. And my practices for that would be usually about six hours in length a day. Very, very taxing on the body. Again, in my mind, doesn't count because it's not a workout. I'm not working out. I'm doing taiko drumming. I'm not working out. I'm riding my bike to school. Lots of physical activity every single day, in my opinion, didn't matter at all. I should have been eating a lot more. I should have been eating a lot better. But in my mind, I didn't think it counted. But the funny thing is I would then get home and I would go for a run thinking I needed to work out in order to keep my conditioning up for my cardio, <laughs> even though I had already ridden my bike almost an hour and 20 minutes and, and so forth and done all that uh, taiko drumming. And at the end of the, the uh, semester, it did catch up with me. All of that activity, not really eating enough, not really resting enough. <laughs> um, believe it or not, uh, one of the last sessions I did, it's like, boy, I'm kind of tired. I went to bed Thursday night and I woke up at 11 a.m. the following Sunday. 
So I slept all through Thursday, all through Friday, and all through Saturday, getting up once in a while to go to the bathroom. And I didn't get up until Sunday. I had enough knowledge of the passage of time to know it was Sunday. But that's how much it, a toll it took on me because I wasn't eating enough and I wasn't resting enough because I didn't think I needed to eat more because it wasn't technically a workout. So what this all means is that, no, you don't need any sort of special nutritional considerations because you do something called a workout. However, you definitely want to make sure you are eating enough and you are eating good food and you're satisfying your primal appetites in order to recover well from that and any all, and all physical activity you're doing. You shouldn't have to say, I need to eat more because I'm working out or I need to uh, have this protein shake because I'm working out. You should say, I should do this stuff because I'm just overall more physically active and I just need to eat more to satisfy the nutritional demands that come with using your body more for any reason whatsoever. Now, here's a couple of little guidelines that I like to use when it comes to pre intra and post workout nutrition. Okay? So in general, a rule that I've adopted for myself over the years is that any type of bout of physical activity that's an hour or less doesn't require anything at all. Your body has plenty of glycogen in it. Your body has plenty of protein stores and all these other sorts of things. So anything that happens for an hour or less doesn't need any sort of special consideration whatsoever. I've just noticed in my case, whenever I eat more, I'm just eating more than I really need. It doesn't, it's not enough. You can't really do enough in an hour. Even the most gut busting, blood, sweat, and tears workouts, an hour is really not a lot of physical activity when you, when you really get down to it. It really isn't, no matter what you're doing. With that said, Sometimes I will eat something before that hour if I'm going to do a physical activity for like an hour or so, but I'm noticing the timing during the day is like around lunchtime. So if like I'm going out for a bike ride and I'm going to like ride North Table or something, that's only going to take me like an hour, hour and a half. It's not a long bike ride. So I'll be like, eh, I don't need to bring anything. But if I look at the clock, I'm like, eh, by the time I get out there and the drive and everything, it's going to be around 1230. I had a really early breakfast. I'm probably going to be kind of hungry a little bit. So I'll bring some granola bars and make myself a sandwich to eat on the way out there. Not because I need to eat in order to do the workout. It's just I know I'm going to be generally hungry at that time anyway. I want to make sure I got some fuel in my system. So just a little something. And usually for that, it's just I want something in my system. Pretty simple, basic carbohydrates, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, fruit, peanut butter and crackers, a couple of granola bars, something like that. Just get into the system real quick that I can access because it doesn't do you any good to eat something just before your workout when it's going to take three hours to digest. And it's like in your system. Great. The workout happened two hours ago. It's a largely a waste. Uh, Post-workout nutrition, same kind of thing. Now, another funny story. Um, back in the day, I used to wake up early and go to the first gym that I ever belonged to was run by this old bodybuilding couple and, uh, uh, or, uh, the one half of the couple rather, uh, Preston was her name. And I would go and I would work out for two hours lifting weight and God knows how the hell I did anything for two hours. Like what the hell was I doing for two hours? <laughs> right. But anyway, I would work out for like two hours. Then I would, uh, get home, shower up, grab a real quick protein shake and I'd go to work. All right. And then work started at 10 AM. But I noticed very quickly that that protein shake did almost nothing for me whatsoever as far as staving off hunger because I would be in the truck, we'd be delivering equipment and stuff around like quarter after 11. And suddenly I'd be like, oh my God. And they're like, what? Are you okay? I'm like, I need to eat something. And they're like, okay, we'll get something after we deliver this home gym. I'm like, no, now, like, I feel like I'm going to faint. I'm so ravenously starving for food that it hurts. And we'd like pull off in a gas station and get like a burrito or something like that. Like, oh my God, like I've never experienced hunger like that in my life. It just hit me like a bomb. It was really, really weird. So in the interest of post-workout nutrition, know that when you're done with your workout, you're already still digesting stuff you've eaten the, that day. Like right now it is like two o'clock. I had a big salad uh, for lunch around noon. I had chicken on it and cheese and all this sort of thing. If I went out and worked out right now, like I still haven't fully digested that chicken yet. I'm sure like if I don't need to eat anything after that because I'm still processing all that protein and stuff. Uh, especially when you consider the fact that 
a lot of times people work out and just with your normal meal cycle, you're probably going to be eating within the next several hours anyway. So do you need to eat anything afterwards? Probably not. Again, if it's like an hour long workout, don't worry about it too much. If you get an experience like me, <laughs> where it's like, if I don't get something to eat shortly after, I'm just going to be ravenous in an hour, then yeah, definitely grab something for sure. Something with a good protein hit uh, to it to give it some sticking power. Uh, but listen to your body with this sort of thing. The bottom line is don't think you need to follow any sort of regular rules of like, do this, you have to do this before a workout, you have to do this after a workout. No, you don't. Because ultimately, like all things in nutrition, what matters most is your overall nutritional approach 24 seven throughout the week. The body doesn't change and adapt so acutely that it matters if you eat or consume something within minutes before or after your workout. What matters more is what are you doing in the 24 hours before and after that workout that matters the most. So if you have a workout at 6 a.m. on like a weekday, what you eat for dinner that night is probably more something you should consider rather than what kind of protein shake should I have something after, or even if you need a protein shake. Take a more holistic view to your nutrition. Make sure you're getting enough food overall. Make sure you're minding your three Ps, your plant, protein, and portion at each meal. If you think you need more food, great. Add more food. If you think you might want to decrease it, whatever, you know, and that will probably take care of you because it's generally if you have a general good approach to nutrition, that's probably going to cover any sort of nutritional requirements imposed from your workouts more than anything else. And then just add and tweak things a little bit here and there, just based on experience. Like if you're doing a, you know, a, a big bike ride, you're like, okay, it's a three hour bike ride. I'm definitely going to need something to eat because I'm riding up Deer Creek Canyon or something. Then yeah, bring some granola bars and stuff. But at the same time, if you're like, yeah, I'm good for, you know, two hours on a bike or an hour workout or something. Do you need anything in between? No, you don't. <laughs> Chances are very good. That you're not creating enough of nutritional demand that any such thing is uh, required. So it's a little bit of experience, a little bit on what works best for you. But overall, don't worry about it too much. Just have more of an overall approach to getting your whole diet uh, dialed in. And that'll probably take care of you as far as your, quote, workout nutrition. All right. Let's see what we can do to some questions. M. Rogan. Hey, what's up? First time live stream viewer here. Welcome, my friend. Welcome. Feel free to drop comments and questions. And as a reminder to everybody, if you put a hey, Matt, in the subject line, I know that's directed to me because I know people are conversing back and forth quite a bit. And uh, that way I don't just suddenly read in the middle of someone's conversation and uh, stuff like that. Uh, let's see. Let's see. <clears throat> oh, here's a good one. <laughs> What's your take on Red Bull energy drinks, etc.? How bad are they for us? So, uh, I mean, this one, full disclosure, very biased. One of my vices in life are uh, monster energy drinks. I drink uh, pretty much about one a day kind of thing. Sometimes if I'm really dragging two, two a day kind of thing. Um, but uh, I've never been big on the Red Bull kick. Funny story about that, actually, when I was uh, 17, I went over to Europe for a tour of Europe with some friends of mine and our host father. Uh, we were hiking in the Alps every day. And sometimes I'd be like really tired. And again, I was like, I'm not doing my Taekwondo. I'm not doing my workouts. How am I going to stay in shape? I'm like, dude, you're hiking eight hours a day. What do you mean? You're, <laughs> you're, you're doing more physical activity now. But again, it didn't count as a workout. But anyway, sometimes I get tired and, he, and my host father, he'd be like, you need to ride the pool. He'd say like that, you need to ride the pool. And at the time, I was really, really nervous about anything with alcohol in it. Because alcohol has got a very bad history in my family. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. Keep your funny European alcohols, crap stuff away from me. It's like, you need to ride the pool. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because they had it there years before we had it in the States. And then, of course, years later, I heard about this Red Bull stuff. I'm like, Oh yeah, he was right. I needed that. <laughs> like that would have been great. <laughs> I, I would have enjoyed that immensely kind of thing. So here's the deal. Yes, of course, a big shot of caffeine can be problematic uh, just because it's a big bomb of the stuff, right? If, if you drank um, that much caffeine and green tea, it'd be like just having intravenous tea kind of thing. So for some people, it can be problematic. 
uh, especially if you're sensitive to caffeine. I know a lot of people get dogmatic, like it's bad for you, it's good for you. No, it's always nuanced, just like anything else in nutrition. Uh, and be aware of your abilities, right, with that sort of thing. Where, you know, sometimes if I if my uh, if I drink two monsters back to back, if I'm just kind of stressed out and everything like that, I'd be like, oh boy, I'm not okay. That probably wasn't the best idea because my body's like overloaded. I'm kind of jittery and everything. I crash afterwards. I'm like, okay, that wasn't such a good thing. But after one, I'm fine. Like I don't notice any crash. I don't notice any jitters. I'm perfectly okay. So it's kind of a, again, experiment and see what you, how you feel for yourself kind of deal. It's never going to be as bad. It's good kind of thing. Know what's good and bad for you as far as your general uh, caffeine consumption. And that'll be uh, your best answer. Michael coming on. Hey, Matt. Uh, being someone who came from the obese end of the spectrum, and by the way, everybody, if you don't know Michael's story, he's got a hell of a one. He's lost a ton of weight, kept it off. Uh, I thought I could outwork my seven soda with my five cheeseburgers and postponing my training session from daily to once a week. Yeah. So it, that's the thing is the, the liquid calories are always where I tell people start there. Uh, and liquid calories are all liquid calories. I know a lot of people get on me about this one. But I always tell people, cut back the liquid calories first because it's way easier to consume a lot of calories, oftentimes a lot of sugar, but also fat too, in liquid form than it is in fat form. Uh, there are these infographics that go around the internet every once in a while that show like, you know, this Starbucks tall frappo mappo latto chino thingy has the calories and sugar equivalent of like, 15 Reese cups or something crazy to make you scared about it, right? So it's like, oh my God, I'm never going to drink that stuff. Look at all the stuff that's in there. But I take the opposite perspective when I'm like, so you're saying there's really not that much in a couple of Reese cups. Hmm. Okay. Very good. Good to know. Good to know. Reese cups aren't that bad then. It's, it's just a perspective kind of thing. But yeah, liquid calories are where we can make the biggest dent if you're looking to cut back way easier than food because it's so much easier to consume it. You barely notice you consume it because you can drink it down and five minutes later still be hungry. Um, and uh, yeah, that's usually where I tell people to go. And that includes all liquid calories and from any source. And that's why people get on my tail because they're like, what? That smoothie that I just ate, it was all organic and I'm on this juice cleanse and all, you know, this juice uh, protein shake and stuff. It's like, do you have any idea how many calories can be in those damn things? We had a smoothie at the cafe. One of the gyms I worked at had 1500 calories in it. You know, so people would be like, oh, I just worked out, drink that down. And I'm like, you're easily putting back the calories you just burned and then some. Right? You'd be better off not consuming at all. And that's a, one of the big reasons why I think people get too hung up on like workout nutrition, especially if you're trying to lose weight. People ask me all the time, I'm trying to lose weight. I just worked out. What should I eat? Nothing. <laughs> and don't eat anything if you don't have to because you're just basically putting it back uh, and uh, you're, you're going backwards with that sort of thing. So that's why I'm always saying if you want more food, more calories, get it from food. It's a hell of a lot easier to regulate. Even if it is junk food relatively, it's still easier than liquid sources. And when you do drink liquid sources, make sure it counts. It's not a normal, regular thing. Kubota08, good to see you again, my friend. Yo, Matt, can too many pieces of fruit day be bad? I eat around four or five pieces a day. Um, there, I mean, there's a limit to everything, obviously. You know, there's some limit, but eh, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, there was a Stronger by Science was talking about with a lot of people with fruit, they're going to fructose. Oh, my God, fructose. Don't no, no, it's the devil's sugar kind of thing. And the, the Stronger by Science, you could probably search the podcast feed for that about a uh, fructose study where they basically took these individuals and they just pumped them full of fructose. And I forget what the dose was, but it was like basically if you just sat down and ate fruit continuously all day, that's what the level was to see what would happen. And basically nothing happened. Uh, if In fact, they actually lost a little bit of weight because they noticed that subjects were eating so much sweetened fructose that when it came time for their normal food sweet stuff that they would eat, they were like, no, I've had too many sweets today. I can't even stand sweet right now. I'm not going to have that ice cream that I usually have and stuff. So they actually ended up losing weight from it. So chances are I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I eat a good amount of fruit myself. Um, I've never once known anybody in my profession who is like, oh, you know, I 
went whole hog on those strawberries and peaches over the weekend. And I just got blown up or anybody who was like, yeah, I started to finally lose weight once I cut apples out of my diet, like never happens. So no matter how we're trying to connect fruit to obesity and poor health, it's such a small flimsy connection that I don't think it's worth any attention to it whatsoever. <clears throat> Jay Brown, I used to drink an extra large, extra cream, and extra sugar coffee every morning. I lost a lot of weight by cutting that out. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. Still smoky out here in Colorado. Uh, yeah, there was a tale I once heard of a guy who went to a nutritionist. He's like, how am I not losing weight? How am I gaining weight? I just drink coffee all day. And she was like, well, what kind of coffee? It was just black. But he was actually still putting in sugar and cream and stuff, and he was just chugging uh, that stuff all day long. And it was 3000 calories of coffee, so to speak. Regular coffee doesn't have hardly any calories in it. It's the stuff we add to it that gets uh, in trouble. Fro 10 Inferno with the awesome avatar. Uh, hey Matt, I did quite a few slow high tension pull-ups the other day. Awesome. Uh, today, the area near my shoulders and armpits feels like it's about to tear when I Try any idea what's going on. Yeah, you probably just, it's tight, it's stiff. You might have strained a little bit of something. Those muscles right behind the shoulder, the infraspinatus, some in particular, uh, teres minor and major back there is also uh, key. And since you were going at such a slow tempo, you probably had more tension in that for a given amount of time, either at the top or the bottom of your range of motion, which is where those muscles may have been engaged a little bit more. So you probably just overloaded them and overstressed them. So I would go through some just nice big shoulder circles, just self-regulated, don't even hang from bar, just something there to get the blood flowing into it, give yourself plenty of recovery and you'll probably be right as rain. And of course, if it continues giving you problem for several days, like a week or so afterwards, you might wanna get that checked out. Oh, here, once again, coming on uh, front end, also saying, uh, do you know what could be the cause of shoulder and neck pain during push-ups and pull-ups? Could it be due to a lack of warm-up? Doubtful. Uh, I would bet money that your scaps are locked in a place that is putting pressure on it, probably elevated. I would put money on that one. You've got an elevated scapula when you're doing push-ups, when you're doing pull-ups and stuff. I've got a new series of videos coming out on the YouTube channel later today that are going to be new videos for next month's Grind Style Calisthenics program on stability complexes. And they have a lot of scapular movement and mobility and, and stability exercises in there. Very, very simple stuff. Highly recommend those. That'll probably take care of you if that's the uh, that's the case. Diego Serta, or Curta, Serta, I believe. Uh, does caved in shoulders during pull-ups rob you of any progress? Uh, I begin the rep with my shoulders down and wide, but the cave as I reach the top. Yes, actually, it's very likely that's happening because when our shoulders hunch, and I'm assuming this is what you mean by caved in. So you've got maybe a little elevation, but protraction, and you're like this. This is what I like to call the off position for your for your upper body. When you're in that position, a large, the very good chance that most of the muscles in your torso are just turning right off. They're not even there anymore. And that, that consequently is why a lot of people feel stress in the elbow and the wrist and all sorts of joints, because pain in the joint means there's not enough going on in the muscles. So yeah, I think it is something you should be addressing and I would definitely get it taken care of and try to pull back as much as you can, maybe downshift into body weight rows for the time being. Federico, so good to see you, man. Hey Matt, congrats on the new P for the PDFs. Thank you very much. Now that I have a Kindle, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can read PDFs on Kindles though. It's not the best way to go about it, uh, though, but you can read on your computer. Mm. Great to know that you can spread more of the RDP word. When is Fitness Independence 2 coming? Very good question. So that's the next book I'm working on. It's kind of the sequel to it. Um, it's going to be a while. My uh, planned release date is probably around Halloween. Fingers crossed. Uh, it's been a bit of a slog. So what I'm trying to do with this book is just really, really, I wouldn't say change the game, but um, I'm basically trying to 
formalize the fundamental approach to fitness. And that's never been done before. So it's not quite like some of my other books where it was about taking information from other sources that's out there and just putting it together. And there you go. Uh, this is this is a whole new thing. And that takes a bit more time and work on uh, mine as well. So uh, hopefully Halloween. Hopefully Halloween is the answer. Milena, hey Matt, what do you think about fat burners? Probably mostly a waste of money, um, but at the same time, uh, it probably not. So the biggest, so you're, to settle the, the story once and for all, like what is the most effective weight loss drug? Because it does exist. There is a weight loss drug out there. Uh, it's very effective. Uh, it's relatively safe. It's extremely cheap and it's easy to get. It's called caffeine. And nine times out of 10, whenever you have a fat burner, it's just a caffeine pill. Because ultimately, in order to, quote, burn fat, which you already automatically do anyway, it's not hard to do that. It's like breathing. You're already doing it. Uh, you just simply have got to increase your expenditure and decrease your intake. And generally what caffeine does is it kind of ramps up your system just a bit, just a bit. Uh, so you, you're typically a little bit more active, maybe an increase in what they call neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which can be a substantial increase and in influence to your overall calorie expenditure. And more importantly, it decreases appetite. That's one of the biggest powers of caffeine is it decreases your appetite because it kind of puts you in fight or flight. If you're in fight or flight, then your appetite goes down, energy goes up. Rest and digest or parasympathetic nervous system dominance is the other way around. Okay, so caffeine is, quote, the best weight loss drug, which is what most fat burners are, in which case, you got people get nervous about Red Bull and stuff like that. And fat burner, I don't even want to know what the hell is in that stuff. So that's why when people are like, I want a little boost, I'm like, get some coffee, <laughs> get some yerba mate. You know, that stuff's gotten a lot more popular now. You can get it in cans and like 7 Elevens and stuff like that. There you go. There's your fat burner. That's the best thing for you. And again, be prudent if you are sensitive to caffeine. You know yourself better than I do. Rafa, hey Matt, what would you, be your recommendation on pre-workout meal or shake to help you have good workout early in the morning? Oh, very good. So this one's kind of, again, you got to figure out what works best for you. There are some people I know out there who, if they work out without eating anything beforehand, they feel better. Some people, uh, like, it, it depends too when the workout is. But by the time I get to work and I warmed up and everything, it's been a, an hour or two. And if I don't have anything in my system, I'm good, but then I crash quickly. Uh, so if that's your case, something simple, but nothing too heavy in your stomach. Uh, right back with the Taekwondo stuff, I'd eat so much and then I would just be a slug on the floor. So fruit is typically good. Granola bar, uh, a, a standard uh, one for me is just a little PB&J sandwich. That works pretty well. It goes through into the system pretty quick. Got some simple carbs, but it's also got a little bit of staying power. If you got like some whole wheat bread and good peanut butter, nut butter on it kind of thing. That's usually the way I go for it. You don't want to like, you don't want to feel like you've eaten a meal is the point I'm trying to make. You want to feel like you got just a little in your system, like in, in uh, race car terms, a little splash and go for fuel. And then you go and you do your whole work and you're like, that was awesome. Then you go and you can eat your full breakfast and everything. So splash and go approach for nutrition if you're looking for something like that. Dexter, hey, Dexter, how's it going? Uh, I was wondering if you're familiar with HPA axis dysfunction and how uh, and could offer any lifestyle changes to assist from recovering it. Unfortunately, no, I'm not very familiar with it. Uh, it'd just be a hazardous guess right now. Um, but one of the things I would recommend is uh, see if you can get uh, like a Google or search in your area for professionals one-on-one. -on -one. Cause usually when there's some sort of a dysfunction, uh, like a, like a condition like that, it's never the same thing. Like scoliosis, like one person's scoliosis can be very different from another person's scoliosis and need very different ways to address it. So you want to kind of get that addressed one-on-one -on -one in person so they can see exactly what's going on. And then they can give you the recommendations on how to best go for it. And I know that, you know, it takes two more time and money, but it's probably going to save you time and money in the long run by getting a direct uh, uh, hit the nail on the head uh, for what you actually need to be doing. So, sorry, it couldn't be more help, but I think that's what you, you should do. Fahad, very good. I like the picture of Guile there in the uh, uh, 
the avatar. Very cool. Hey, Matt, tips on doing pull-ups with uh, a beginner who has no strength. Yeah, just regress the pull-ups. So there's pull-ups that can be regressed from anything from stupid easy to ridiculously hard and everything in between. So like jackknife pull-ups are a classic where you keep your feet on the ground and you have, or if your bar, pull-up bar does not move like that pull-up that pull up bar there, you know, that doesn't go down uh, very much or very easily. So you'd put like a chair on it and then you can use your legs to help yourself on up. And then, then even so don't even do pull it like rows horizontal. Cause fundamentally it's the same movement pattern. It's still pulling. So leaning back on some rings or straps or something and just doing recline rows. That's where I would start you is go with more of a recline row approach for a while. Just build up some of that strength, build up that back and biceps, nice, thick muscle, very strong. And that'll set your foundation for moving forward. Frotan coming on again. Hey, Matt, have you uh, have you come across the do not pull the scapula back and down video? Let's take neurology. Hmm. He says that the scapula shouldn't be pulled back and down as far as sometimes recommended. I have no idea why that would be the case. Um, I mean, that's packing the shoulders. I mean, you go to uh, a lot of strength conferences and everybody's like, pack your shoulders, pack your shoulders. Now, there are certainly times and cases where it's not about keeping your shoulders in any position. You want them to move. Like when you're doing push-ups, you protract at the top, you retract at the bottom. Well, the shoulders, uh, your uh, dips and everything, you know, maybe even a little bit of movement there. So usually having the shoulder blades move and not static is what's prudent. Usually when people have trouble with their shoulder blades in a position, it's because they're not having it in that position. It's because they're leaving it in that position. That's what's causing the problem. It's not being in that position because, I mean, ultimately, like your body is made to move in a variety of ways and none of them are ever bad. We did not evolve any sort of movement pattern that was inherently detrimental. If it was, we wouldn't have evolved with that ability. It's just a case of, okay, that's detrimental in that situation, in that way. Now, why would that be and what's really going on? Uh, because very often uh, the case is user error of something else and we're blaming the other thing. Like another case in point is squats, like knees going over the toes. Isn't that bad? No, it's perfectly fine. It's perfectly healthy. It, we're built for it. It's perfectly okay. But if you have other issues in your hips, in your ankle, for example, then yeah, it can be problematic, but it has nothing to do with the knee. It's all in the hips and the ankle. Luca, hey, Luca. Good to see you again. Hey, man. I tend to round my shoulders forward at the top of the pull-up. Same deal we were talking about before, that, that collapsing, I guess. Is it bad to keep doing them like that? Yeah, you're in the off position, man. So trying to keep them back is definitely the way to go. And for a lot of people who are like, oh, it's all in the biceps, I never feel in the back, that's because your shoulders are up and forward. Get those shoulders down and back, and it will change for you substantially. And when it comes to progressive pull-ups where you got more weight on one arm, that's almost a must uh, in order to do that. So yeah, definitely down and back is the way to go about it. Hey, Ashley, uh, do you know any tips on losing weight after the baby? More cardio, weightlifting, so on and so forth. Uh, after the baby's going to be tricky, not because of physiological changes you've gone through, because obviously you have, uh, but also lifestyle changes that you have. I mean, you've got a new one in the family, like that's going to do a lot to disrupt your schedule, disrupting sleep, uh, disrupting you know your ability to relate to other people in the household, other kid, children, uh, that sort of thing is as much of a consideration as anything else. So usually when people have a big change in their life like that, moving to a different city or something, I'm always like, just do something, whatever you can to just keep the momentum going. Like right now, that's your one and only job is keep that momentum going in the habits of training some way, shape or form. Keep your body moving. Take care of yourself. It's very easy for particularly new mothers uh, or new members of family to say, OK, uh, fitness and exercise in the gym. Time out. I'm putting you on the back burner until I can get the baby thing handled. And it's like, okay, well, now they're an infant. Okay, till the terrible twos are done. Okay, now, once they go back to school, okay, 
once I can help them get through this trouble in school. And it's just one thing after another, and then it just stretches out. So do something, anything. Don't worry, is this right or optimal or anything? Just doing anything is your gut job right now. Refer to my book, Micro Workouts, for quick workouts that take hardly no time at all. And also my flexible workout approach that makes it a lot easier to stay consistent with your workout without having to like shoehorn your long or workout routines into a busy, hectic schedule. It lets you bend and flow rather than break uh, as things go crazy uh, with the new kiddo. And uh, yeah, I mean, who's come to shelf, I would say prioritize strength training because that typically has the best bang for the buck and <laughs> get out for a run while someone else takes care of the kid just for the mental aspect, if nothing else. But yeah, strength training is probably where I would go the most. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hima, hey Matt, I'm suffering from, uh, uh, excuse me, colitis. I have to follow a very low fiber diet. Pardon me. I'm, going, I'm gaining weight over time, prefer, prefer to have small meals before training. Yeah, I would be very prudent about uh, really paying attention to what foods are aggravating your condition and more importantly, which meals may or may not be helping you. So one of the problems with like many small meals a day, which is something that I've always kind of done, is that we get in the habit of eating so frequently and we kind of lose touch with, is this one meal really moving the needle for me? Is it really helping me? And it's easy to overeat. It's easy to eat when we don't need to eat because we're just kind of doing that out of habit and on autopilot and stuff. So be very, very prudent about, do I really want to be eating this? Is this really, am I really truly hungry? Or is this something that I'm just eating purely out of habit? And if you can cut back even one or two of those meals a day, that could make all the difference in the world. <clears throat> Ferris, I build legs without squats. I have an injury, can't do squat. My legs are getting weak. Refer to someone in person uh, for that one. I don't know what the injury is. Everybody's legs are very different. Uh, isometrics may be a good place to go. Uh, typically with injuries, that's a good area, but without knowing what the injury is and what aggravates it and stuff like that in person, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Don't do things that hurt. But at the same time, yeah, you don't have to do squats. Like there's nothing magical about squats. It's just that movement pattern, get the hips closer to the ankles uh, sort of thing. So things like wall sits may be a good place that I would look, but I don't know if that's going to aggravate you or not. Hmm. What do you think about LCHF? Please clarify on that. I'm not familiar with that acronym uh, right now. I could guess uh, what that is, but please make sure I know what I'm talking about. Hey, Matt, any tips to deal with hunger during late night revision? I get acid if I don't eat at night, especially. Well, then just eat. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> you know, I'm a big, big fan of eating later at night if you're hungry, for sure. Uh, so funny story on this one. My brother-in-law... Uh, who's a, just an absolute phenomenal endurance athlete. I mean, he's the kind of guy who signs up for 5Ks where there's 5,000 people and he'll come in like third out of like 5,000 people. Guy, Phenomenal athlete. And so uh, they made some brownies one time and uh, my, my sister Jody and stuff, she's putting the brownies away and Eric, my brother-in-law is like, okay, put the brownies where I can't find them. Like put them somewhere I can't find them. Like that, that's okay. Like I don't want to be tempted. She's like, okay. So she kind of hit the brownies in the kitchen somewhere and stuff. 2 a.m. My sister gets woken up by my brother-in-law. Like, Tony, Tony, where are the brownies? <laughs> Show me where the brownies are. Damn it. Give me the brownies. She's like, oh God, I don't, I don't want to deal with this here. Here is a brownies kind of thing. It's like, so yeah, I mean, I'm not at all opposed to eat, eating at night. If you're hungry at night, eat at night. It's that simple. Uh, when you're hungry, you eat. Very, very basic uh, approach. Nope, excuse me. Already covered that one. <clears throat> uh, yes, okay, very good. So LCH, low carb, high fat. So let me go back to that original question so I know uh, what it was. <clears throat> what do you low carb, high fat? Uh, largely, well, let me put it this way. Worrying about macronutrient content is, for the most part, a complete waste of time uh, to a large degree because your body, we have to recognize that your body's going to do what it wants to do with food regardless of what we want it to do with food. So, so many people get sucked into, okay, this carb and this source and this fat and this source and, and from fruit versus from candy. Versus, 
nothing we believe about nutrition matters whatsoever because your body's ultimately just going to take the food, disassemble it into its nutrient components, and then it's going to use it how it wants to use it. If it wants to turn that protein into fat and make you fatter, it's going to do that. If it wants to turn those carbs into glycogen and fuel you, it's going to do that. If it wants to turn it into fat, it's going to do that. You have no say over how your body uses food. Okay. And that's what uh, I think a lot of people like got to get the macronutrients, should, low carb, high fat and everything. The bottom line is most of your nutritional needs are coming down to just how much are you eating and can you stick to a regular diet? That's 98% of a healthy diet right there, right there. Everything else is largely details. So when people talk about low carb, high fat and stuff like that. The only reason why we should ever consider such things is if you're like, I just don't feel good on any carbohydrates and I feel better on fat. There you go. And in which case it matters nothing what I think about it. It's all about what you think. But there are so many people like people should eat this way. People should eat that way kind of thing. This is completely a waste of time because how I think you should eat is worthless. Absolutely a waste of time. You know, how some celebrity or some diet doctor on Dr. Oz says you should eat are complete bonkers because no one has any business telling you how you should eat because no one knows how you should be eating. It is completely unethical to tell people how they should eat. When I started nutrition in college, um, my good friend and professor who I had many classes with always started off at every class, regardless of what it was, unless you know the person, unless you know their requirements and unless you have know their goals, you have no business whatsoever telling them what they should be eating. Full stop. And that's why like when people are like, you should be eating this way, you should be eating that way. There's no way they could possibly know that. And they have no business telling you that at all. They're just producing some sort of content. That's why eat, the eat to satisfy method here is satisfy your hunger, satisfy your need for nutrients, Make sure your diet is enjoyable, right? And you're enjoying it and it's sustaining good energy level. Beyond that, I don't give a damn how you eat. It doesn't matter. I don't care if it's high fat, low fat, high carb, low carb, where your protein sources are from, whether you're vegan or carnivore or whatever, does not matter at all. We put too much attention and focus in these things based on other people's opinions. And the only person's opinion that matters is yours. That's it. If you don't like something about your diet, you should change it. It doesn't matter if someone's like, oh, you should be eating this way. Screw them. They don't know what they're talking about. You're the one who's in charge of your diet. You make the call. So what are my opinions about these sorts of things? It doesn't matter because I try not to have an opinion on these sorts of things. But at the same time, your diet's not going to be healthy because it's low carb. Don't base your diet off of those sorts of things because those things are not what you should base a diet off of. That's the big mistake we always make. It's like, oh, this food is vegan. I should eat it. Dude, it's, it's ice cream bars with lots of chemicals. Oh, who cares? It's vegan. That means it's safe. When we have these qualifiers of it's vegan, it's paleo, it's low fat, it's car high carb, whatever the case may be, we're literally dropping our defenses and removing our ability to intelligently select what is actually best for us. And we're basically telling companies, make the choice for me based off of this one rule that someone else imposed upon me. You don't have control of your diet anymore. Someone else does, and that's a very scary thing to be in. So I know that's a roundabout way, but ultimately what are my thoughts about most things? I don't, and that's the way it should be. <clears throat> Let's see, hey, Matt, recommendations, food supplements to help with joint and tendon health, very good. Uh, so I know there's a lot of mixed stuff on like collagen and stuff like that. Glucosamine used to have a lot behind it, but now people are like, meh, kind of thing. Uh, I would say instead of looking at diet, think of more of why the hell are your joints in bad shape? Uh, that's usually the case uh, that we want to be looking at because, you know, when people are like, oh, I do this exercise and my joints hurt, my joints hurt this, my joints hurt that. It's like, what are you doing that's causing the pain? Where's the stress coming from? Uh, it's very rare that stress in a joint is from a nutrition deficiency. It's almost always a mechanical reason behind it. So case in point, like I've got an issue in my right hip that has been plaguing me forever. Finally went to see a chiropractor and I'm getting chiropractic care for it. And in like two weeks, it's almost completely gone. 
because they're like, oh yeah, because your posture here and you've got this little bit of a tilt here and you're out of alignment here. We need to make this adjustment, you know? And, and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. This is much better. Good. Because we actually pinpointed the source of the stress and now we're moving where the stress is coming from. And there we go. I doubt anything I would put in my mouth as far as uh, food would make any difference whatsoever. Uh, so that's what I would do for uh, joint stuff is why is there stress and why is there damage there? And if you need to get the damage addressed, like sometimes surgically or something, get that taken care of as well. Uh, but uh, if diet has much of a say on it, it's probably not enough of a say to n- enough of an influence to really uh, mitigate the, uh, the issue, unfortunately. Uh, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> uh, drop away, daddy. Nice sermon. Thank you, man. I, I try not to do these long winded things on these things. I know you people have questions and you're not here to just hear me yammer on forever, but sometimes I get on my soapbox. Uh, Prod. Hey, Matt, what's a good weight for calisthenics for someone who is 5'10"? I wanted to do static holds. Very good. Currently can do about 12, 13 pulls. Very nice. Max, one rep, max, 45 uh pounds with a ring jump. Oh, very impressive. Very nice. Good. Uh, so good weight for body weight, are you asking? Or uh, weight to be using and stuff like that? So the thing is calisthenics and body weight and stuff, they kind of sometimes start to regulate themselves on out. Um, but again, a lot of it depends on build. You know, there are some people who are five foot 10, because that's my height, and they're built like my brother-in-law. He's very lean, very, very slender. Uh, he's built like an arrow. He's shoom, right through the water when he swims. I'm blocky torso guy. I'm like a freaking Lego mini figure. And I have nothing slender and slight about me. Everything is kind of wide and bulbous. Like you just stretched me out width wise. And so, yeah, I'm heavier than my brother-in-law by a good 40 pounds. I've got more muscle than him, but still, I'm probably going to be a lot heavier than him just because of my build. So I would say uh, aim for more of just uh, having a relatively low body fat, like around 15, 10 to 15% is probably a good place to aim. And wherever your weight ends up with that is where it's going to end up. Because you also, too, you got to consider muscle, too. Uh, some people just put on muscle easier. Some people have a more muscular build. Some people have a more slight build. That's also something to consider as well. So I, I would go more for body fat than anything. And just prop, pop in right here, 57, 13% body fat fluctuating. Yeah. I'd say that's probably a, you know, pretty good, pretty average for someone about, you know, pretty lean and and slight your size. Good. Why would you think that wouldn't be good? Uh, Why do you think it should change around? Uh, I guess would be another question too, uh, is uh, why do you think that might be bad? Uh, I don't think there's anything bad, nothing showing up in in my, uh, around there. Hey Matt, uh, how do you cycle with this pedaling? (laughs) I push the pedal and the other one comes up. Mm. Do you pull on your handlebar to push the pedals forward or do you push against them to push the pedals backwards? Uh, the forward feels a bit is a front lever. Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. Well, generally when I'm climbing, I'm pulling on that. My book, Bodyweight Training for Cycling, specifically has rows for that reason. When you go uphill, like you're kind of pulling the bars underneath you, especially if you're on a road bike. Um that's the case. So that's definitely going up. When I'm going downhill, it may be the opposite, like you said, like I'm kind of pushing in the bar. Because of course, if you're downhill, your weight's kind of falling forward. I'm pushing against the handlebar. So it's probably more just the incline, you know, pulling on the way up, pushing on the way down, neutral when I'm flat. Very good. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's kind of the way the way I would go about it. Crack rock. Hey, hey. good to see you, my friend. Hey, Matt. I just don't care. <laughs> just as the seasons come and go, my interest in training waxes and wanes. Absolutely. How would you tell, uh, how would you sell training to someone who could take it or leave it? Oh, yeah. This is actually a very interesting question here because uh, I wanted to uh, talk about something like this in another episode where it's like, what do you do for fitness when you just, you're like, eh whatever. I don't really care about it so much anymore. Because on one side, we like, we want to handle something. We want to take care of ourselves. But at the same time, do we have to make it a big deal? And the answer is no. Uh, refer to the book I have on the, the free ebook I have on reddeltaproject.com, Ultimate Minimalist Fitness Program, uh, which was basically written for this purpose. Like if you came to me and you're like, I know I got to be healthy, but I just don't care. What do you recommend? 
that program. Because one of the things that I think a lot of people are missing when it comes to fitness is our fitness culture is between two ends. It's like, you've got to make fitness this big deal. It's your identity. It's your lifestyle. It's who you are as a person. It's what you dedicate your life to. And you spend all your time and energy working out and dieting and exercising on podcasts like this and stuff. And then on the other hand, you're like, I just don't care. I don't do a damn thing. I don't put any attention to it whatsoever. And I think to a large degree, this neglects the bulk of our population because it's like a bell curve, right? It, unless you truly don't care and you're like, I could die when I'm 30. It doesn't matter if I heart attack. I don't care if I feel like crap. It's not important to me. And the other side who are like fully invested in their models and professional athletes, great. But the bulk of us are somewhere in between. In which case, we do need to do something, but we don't really want to make it everything. So things like the Ultimate fit, Minimalist Fitness Program uh, are perfect for that. I look at it kind of like getting your fitness habits, like brushing your teeth. Like I'm not a dentist. I don't go to dental clinics. I don't post social media posts about my new toothbrush and mouthwash and debate on Reddit forums about what kind of dental floss is flossing as good as using Listerine or not and everything. And it's like, Dude, it's a means to an end. That's all it is to it. It's enjoyable. I like it. But fundamentally, it's just it's to get a job done and that's it. And when we get to that point, we get actually a lot of power because you can take it, that sort of minimalist approach, do what is necessary, but not waste your time in the stuff that, frankly, probably doesn't care. doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot. <clears throat> excuse me, Prod, once again, coming on, do you necessarily have to train for longer than an hour a day to progress in strength training? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not, my good friend. In fact, uh, as I talk about my book, Micro Workouts, all you need to do to progress is create a progressive stimulus. That's all you need to do. And you can do that in a matter of seconds if you know what you're doing. You can do it probably in about five to 10 minutes. The duration of your workout actually has very little to do with the effectiveness of your workout. Uh, unless, of course, the goal has to do with duration. Like I said, I want to be able to run for an hour straight, or I want to be able to see how many pull-ups I can do in 20 minutes or something. Then time matters. But this is one of those things as a fitness coach that kind of irks me a little bit as people would buy an hour of personal training and we'd get done in 50 minutes or 45 minutes and they'd be like, okay, we've got like 15 minutes left. I'm like, go home. I'm like, yeah, but we still have more time. I'm like, we did everything we need to do. Like, I'm, it's just busy work at this point. Yeah, sure. I'll give you something if you just want to burn some calories or just relieve some more energy or whatever. That's cool if you want to hang out. But we did what we came here to do. Why expand upon it? So more than an hour, absolutely not. I mean, I can jump, I keep doing that. I can jump up on that pull-up bar, you know, and create more of a progressive stimulus in five minutes than I used to be able to create in over an hour, just because I know how to create that stimulus. I'm not just relying on work and work and more work and more work and more work and assuming hopefully it counted for something. When, when you have your eye on, I'm trying to make my muscle work harder and better than it was before. And that you can do extremely quickly, which is why micro workouts works uh, because it's not about how long you're training. It was purely down to uh, are you uh, creating that stimulus? <clears throat> uh, Sadek, oh, I don't think that's my do, 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 my uh, how to build the maximum muscle. Oh, this is a good one here. So this one goes along with the optimization. So he's asking, uh, can I ask like, how to build maximum muscle. Here's the thing. Remember, maximum and optimum is not something you can keep first and foremost, right? Optimum, that, that gets thrown around all the time, like optimal amount of this and as much as possible. Keep in mind that we have an ability, a range to accomplish, but you can't go to 100% and stay there. I always use the analogy of like climbing up Mount Everest, right? We can go to the top of Mount Everest, we can get there. We are physically capable of there, but we can't stay there. That's the, the death zone. You stay up there, you're going to die. And that's the way it is with everybody's health and fitness. How lean can you get? How strong can you get? How good your performance on the field can be? How much muscle you have? And so on and so on and so on. Your maximum amount is something you can achieve, but only under extreme circumstances and investment and for a relatively short period of time. And then you're going to have to scale back. 
you're not going to have a choice in the matter. So that maximum level is not something you can maintain. And this is where a lot of frustration comes from in our fitness culture is because people push to their max and then they're pissed off that they can't maintain it. You can't. It's impossible. There's no way because you have to have so many ducks in a row. Maximum effort. It's like sprinting out of your front door and wondering why you start slowing down after 100 yards. Like, Why am I slowing down? I need to be going at my max speed. No, you can't maintain that. So the goal is instead of optimum and maximum and stuff, which sounds sexy, what we really want is just better than what we have now. And that is maintainable most of the time. That is achievable. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm making barely getting by with my bills, I want to be a billionaire. Good luck if you can get there. And yeah, a lot of people who reach that status don't keep it. You know, they're here and then they're gone. You know, one stock option trade away from losing $50 million kind of thing. So they, they don't stay there for the most part. And then, but when we're like, I just want to be better off than I was now, that's what we can turn our attention to. Because that's also something that you can also achieve. If I'm a day hiker, I'm like, I want to hike Mount Everest. It's too big a step. It's probably never going to happen anyway. But I could be like, I want to hike a peak that's 200 feet higher than the one I just did. Boom, that's doable and something you can feel proud about in your accomplishment. And that will make a big improvement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hey, Matt, hope you're good. I am, except for the little uh, congestion. Excuse me. Mm. Do you think there's any real values in doing stomach vacuum? Thanks. Yes, your TVA, your transversi abdominis. I think it's a non-neglected muscle group. I think it's definitely something to, to hit and just sucking everything in the stomach vacuuming. I think there's definitely good, and it doesn't take hardly any time. It doesn't take hardly any skill or stress or anything like that. I can't think of any reason not to do it. So, yeah, practice it. Uh, would weighted pull-ups increase pull-ups from 12 to uh, 13 to 20 straight? Or would training bodyweight pull-ups help to get to 20 straight pull-ups? Either way, either way, always remember that it's about proficiency, okay? Proficiency, how good are you at pull-ups? That's the objective. You're not going to get to 20 pull-ups until you get better at doing pull-ups. Now, if you stick with bodyweight and you try and do more, then that's fine. You can get there, but your mindset can't be on, I'm just going to practice doing pull-ups as many pull-ups as possible. No, that's like me banging on a piano with oven mitts and hoping that Beethoven starts to play uh, kind of thing. Focus on proficiency. This is how we create that stimulus I was talking about earlier. You have to focus on how you're trying to do something better. So if, when it comes to straight body weight, the goal is how do I make those reps better? And it's really easy to figure out how to, how to do that because your first rep is going to be your best rep and then your 12th or 13th rep, something's going to be off. Okay, Something's going to erode from a technical standpoint. What erodes, which is probably body position or range of motion or speed, that's what you got to work on. Okay, so you keep it more consistent. And then once you get better at doing those later reps, you'll be able to do more. Also, with adding weight, will that do it? Same exact thing. The whole point of adding weight with calisthenics is not to add weight. The goal is basically saying, oh, you can do those pull-ups pretty well. Now let's see how good your pull-ups are with 20 extra pounds on you. The point of that weight is to challenge your technique. So you start doing it like, oh my gosh, my range of motion went down pretty quickly and my bodies are, my legs are flailing around and stuff like that. Okay, good. Again, look at what that is and work on that sort of thing. Proficiency is the name of the game. We get results because we get more proficient. It's not the weight. It's not the reps. It's not how good we are. Those are things we use to test our proficiency. And as you improve your proficiency, the numbers will naturally increase. Uh, a couple more real quick here. Ben Adden. Another question. Some people recommended training rotator cuffs every day. Is it really safe? I can see it's safe, but I don't do any direct rotator cuff work because it's already involved with a lot of calisthenic stuff anyway. Um, you know, things that uh, involve stability in the shoulder are very good. Uh, the scapular motions that I have in the stability exercises coming up are very good. Uh, any rotating exercises, like if you're doing angle 90 handles or rings or something like that. I'm a big fan of doing stuff with rotation. That'll take care of it as well. Um, so, I mean, technically you're using your rotator cuffs every day anyway. 
So yeah, uh, but uh, sometimes people will also like they'll rotator cuff, rotator cuff, rotator cuff in a way to think that they're bulletproofing their shoulders. But if your technique still sucks, your shoulders are still going to get stressed. The rotator cuff, like a lot of muscles, when people are like, oh, it's sore, there's no possible way to make it strong enough to avoid that. If it's getting overloaded, there's no exercise in the world that's going to make it strong enough. It's too small a muscle. It's never going to be big and strong enough. Instead, you want to know why is it getting overloaded when you're doing that exercise? Uh, and chances are something else isn't engaging enough. Your lats, your chest, your triceps, some other big muscle that's supposed to be shouldering the load is where it's supposed to be uh, getting addressed. So that, that's the thing. I go for it, but uh, I'm, I don't think it's really worth the payoff because it's not really addressing the real thing. Always remember that when it comes to solving problems in fitness, if your solution really works, it should work quick. Okay, so case in point, my chiropractor, right? Like two weeks, I'm noticing a huge improvement in difference. I'm like, oh, wow, that feels so much different. That's what should happen. But, you know, you see these guys in the gym and they're like doing rotator cuff, oh, my shoulders, my shoulders, my shoulders, my shoulders for months, years of this. It's like, dude, if it's not fixing it, it's not working. It's that bottom line. People are like rolling out their IT band before their leg workout every time. My IT band, oh my gosh. It's not solving the problem. You're, you're not addressing the real cause. Figure out what the real cause is fix it. And then you never have to do rotator cuff and foam rolling stuff again, because it's just unnecessary. <clears throat> Matt, maybe a stupid question. No stupid questions, my friend. Uh, but do you think cocaine is so unhealthy and why? So <laughs> I have to tell this funny story. Um, so my boss uh, at one of my gyms, he's got a different pass than me. So for me, I, I've always been very straight laced. Like I didn't have my first alcoholic drink until I was 24, never done any kind of drug outside of like caffeine kind of thing and alcohol, um, you know, the occasional beer. So stuff like that. I'm always like, <laughs> stay away. Cause I know my personality. I would be homeless on the street as a hopeless drug addict overnight. If I did that stuff, I just, I know that about me, but, <laughs> but my boss was like, we were talking one time. I was like, I did it once. And I was like, Oh really? What was it? It was like, I had two thoughts. One, this stuff is awesome. And two, I should never, ever have this stuff in my body ever again because it was just that much powerful. So it always brings up the idea, though, is it's a drug. It's like any other drug. Like it's oxycodone is good, you know, and well, not anymore, but it used to be and heroin is bad. Why? They're basically the same thing kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, a lot of drugs that were deemed terrible are now being used medicinally and we're using them for beneficial reasons. So maybe something like that will happen with cocaine because a lot of it just comes down to dose. You know, it's like, oh, and this the right dose. This could be very good for this population or something. So I'm always hesitant to flat out say something is healthy or unhealthy. It depends on the use. And well, right now we don't know how to use it in a very healthy way. So that's why it would be largely unhealthy. So I can't recommend it. I certainly don't think, oh yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine or you, it could be healthy. No, don't use it. <laughs> don't do it. Like my boss was saying, is like, I should never, ever, ever do this stuff again. Uh, but, you know, stay tuned uh, and keep an open mind about it as uh, research is done and scientists discover more about uh, possible applications. Because when we close our mind, that's where the real stupid questions come from. Uh, let's see, one more, one more. If I missed anything, thank you so much, everybody, for coming on. Stomach vacuum, got that one taken care of. Oh, here's one that's very good, Rafa. Uh, would, uh, hey, Matt, would, uh, would be some key body cues that your pre-workout is necessary or not? Is it mainly workout performance? Oh, this is a really good one to finish off with. Very good, Rafa. So here's the thing about pre-workout stuff. Um, my pre-workout of choice is black tea. If I'm feeling kind of sloppy, I got some stuff that I get out here that every time I drink it, it's like, God, I'm having a really good workout. It doesn't make me jittery or anything. It's just a good workout. Uh, so first and foremost is to look for just dependence. Like if it's like your go-to when you're just not feeling up for it and you have a, a pre-workout that you like to use, to get you going. Great. Awesome. But when you're like, I can't possibly get up the motivation to work out without this stuff, that's a problem. You don't want to have to be dependent upon a substance in order to go and work out. You should be able to just go uh, kind of thing. 
Um, performance is key. Yeah, if you want to know, is it effective? I would say pay more attention, not just to physical energy, but mental energy. Like, are you struggling or are you killing those reps? So you could do the same thing on paper. Like I got 20 pull-ups. Okay, now are they 20 pull-ups or are they 20 pull-ups kind of thing? Are they the thing that you come off the bar and you're like, yeah, I killed it. Or, oh, thank God that's over. That's what I would pay attention to more than anything else. And I think a lot of that also just comes down to music. And once again, it's all just the holistic nature of your lifestyle. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you managing stress? Are you getting good food into your system all day, every day? Are you eating enough? Those are the things that I would talk about where basically if you've got all that stuff dialed in, the pre-workout should be largely unnecessary. Um, and use it, like I said, just just something that's just like, oh my God, you know, I've, I just had the hell of a time getting to sleep last night. I have no energy today. Okay, this is my little go-to fire extinguisher just to make sure I have at least a good uh, workout. So, okay, folks, thank you so much for coming on. Again, the Red Delta Project Library largely is in PDF form now uh, down below in the merch store, as well as the T-shirts and everything that helps support the channel uh, for those who are asking, as well as the NOSC suspension trainers, which I highly recommend as always. You can see them hanging up on the wall behind me there. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate your attention, everyone. I will talk to you next week. Send in, you can DM me on Instagram if you have any topics that you'd like me to address in these episodes as well in future times because uh, uh, I want to give you what you want. I do this for you. Uh, it, it's that simple. I do this to try and bring as much value to you. And so when you tell me what you want to hear, I can bring that to you. And that makes me a happy guy. So I will talk to you next week. We'll be doing this uh, again next week, roughly around 2.30 p.m. And uh, as always, the, the first initial broadcast is on your local podcast directory. Talk to you then. St uh, be fit and live free.